one. So I've worked in a bunch of different places with different atmospheres. Menus, uniforms, all that. The place I'm at now is definitely the most upscale I've ever worked. Think freshly dry cleaned uniforms and aprons every shift type of place. The kids menu has a filet mignon for crying out loud. And no chicken tenders. The horror. The horror. That's the whole series of posts in and of itself. So, a man in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, at the latest, comes in with his daughter. Couldn't have been more than eight. She's skipping behind him, smiling, having a great time. They sit down, I walk over, start my spiel and greet them. We have off-menu features, so I'm supposed to rattle them off, but I really don't think Miss Star Leggings and her dad would be interested in the red snapper we have cooking up. So I ask them if they'd like to hear the features, or if they have something in mind already. The daughter smirks at her dad, and her dad smiles back at her, and the man told me that they already knew what they wanted. So I very professionally turned to the young girl and asked, Ma'am, what may I get you to drink today? And she, in her full confidence, holding the adult menu that was half the size of her, asked me what we had. I started rattling off the kids' drinks we had, but noticed when she perked up at the mention of Sprite. So I asked her if she'd like me to make her a Shirley Temple. She gave her dad puppy dog eyes, he nodded, and she had stars in her eyes, as she told me yes. She would love a Shirley Temple. We have these speciality rolls, think small fluffy bread rolls, that get fired up for a few minutes to give a crispy golden outer shell with the fluffy inside, and served with salty honey butter. People go nuts for these things. As do I, I could eat the whole warming drawer of them. They're bonkers, bro. Better than Texas Roadhouse Rolls. 100,000%. I asked the girl if she'd like a basket, and she almost shouted a firm, Yes, please! So I told her I'd be right back with their drinks and rolls. She giggled and started chattering with her dad as I walked away, and when I came back, she was on the same side of the booth with her dad, and he was helping her play Raymond, I think. I don't know, some game from his time, though remastered, on his phone, and I heard her say, You're the best, Dad. Thank you. And I hate kids, but man, dude. You got me messed up if you think I didn't do everything in my power to make sure that little girl and her father had the best lunch they could have had. I hope she enjoyed her buttered noodles, Shirley Temple, and rolls, and most importantly, the quality time with her dad. I also cried like a baby on my way home thinking about when me and my dad would go on the daddy-daughter dates when I was a little girl. (sighs) Time flies, man. 2. For a bit of context, I've been at my restaurant for close to two years, and during that time the general manager has turned over three times, most recently a month ago. Not once in my time there have we ever tip-pulled or even discussed it. However, we learned about 30 minutes before opening yesterday that this would be the case for Easter brunch. Everyone groaned about it, but we put up with it for the sake of the day going by smoothly, but everyone had an issue with this. Where the glaring issues arise are that one, servers are required to work every holiday, so almost our entire serving staff was present. Two, there are two servers, not actually serving tables, but running our buffet line, alongside some of our hosts. Three, the servers on buffet are receiving tip-out, while the hosts are paid their normal hourly. No matter how I slice it, the only logical explanation is they didn't want to pay two additional workers on the buffet, and instead lumped them in with us so all the servers can make server money without having to pay them. I think a discussion with management is inevitable, but am I wrong in thinking this feels very illegal? We've got hosts serving buffet, making $16 to $18 hourly, and then servers right next to them making $45 hourly, because they're included in the tip pool. Meanwhile, those of us who made like five to $700 in tips will take home more like $350 if I'm lucky. It also just feels like a massive work disparity, and I feel bad for the servers who were required to come in on an hourly only to be denied the ability to serve. A few more details for clarification. The brunch buffet we run is exclusive to holidays, so it only happens a few times a year. On these days, we take about four times the usual number of reservations, and the style of service is obviously turn and burn rather than our usual fine dining. 
At my restaurant, hosts can also act as food runners, server assistants, buzzers, etc. So they receive what I consider to be a fair tip out under normal circumstances, as do our bartenders, of course. In past years, we would have enough hosts on duty to help work the buffet, while still running their other duties. This year, two servers who normally would be on the floor ended up having to work the buffet line. No choice given. These servers are relatively new hires, so felt like they weren't in a position to argue this, but I personally feel like it's wrong. These two servers were not being paid hourly like the hosts also working buffet. They were included in the tip pool. Ten servers took tables, and we were splitting it twelve ways. And I recognize that holidays being mandatory is pretty standard, and that's not my issue necessarily. I just think if you're going to require someone to be at work, then it should be the job they're hired for. 3. I'm living in North California for the time being, and finding a gig anywhere in the last 16 plus months has been outrageously difficult. I got hired on the spot from these two Middle Eastern guys who just opened a Greek joint. One handles the front, the other one is the... Chef. Both are overly sleazy, dirty, and stink to high heaven types that have only hired young, pretty, inexperienced girls until they hired me due to my impressive background. It's a tip pool house, and the kitchen gets 20% of our tips. I know. I know. I'll keep this short. I've been in the industry for almost 15 years now, and these two give me immediate red flags. The main ones being... The owner only wants servers to ring in tables under his point-of-sale number. He doesn't allow us to enter our tips. He wants us to give him each signed merchant copy so he can input the tips for us. Anytime I've asked about payroll or how tips are distributed when other servers get cut early and I kill it on my tables after they've gone, I've only gotten... Don't worry, my friend. I take good care of you. When he finally gave me a punch-in point-of-sale number, and I printed out a closing shift summary, he runs up and asks, What is this? Why do you do this? What do you? You do not trust me? I pay you, don't worry. I pay you more than the rest. I had previously left for a week because the chef got incredibly upset when a server girl said she needed to get paid after they strung her along for over a month. Tried discussing her wages with me in front of her, then got angry with me, and tried giving me a write-up for saying, I'm uncomfortable with talking about anyone else's pay. That's your guy's business. I just want my checks on time, man. The chef tried saying that it doesn't look good. The next day, I said I got another job that started that day, and picked up my final check. To which they tried making laughable counter-offers. They hired me back a week later with enthusiasm. Anyways, for working over a month, they wrote her a check which shorted her $488, which she brought up immediately, which then got her in even more trouble. The next day, she persisted on their sketchiness, and they cut her another check for $750. I did the math, and that still came out to her making her hourly and barely anything in tips per shift. There are numerous other sketchy things that I have seen both of them try to pull. I'm old and no dummy. I know I'm being screwed over, but it's a serious wasteland in my area, as far as available jobs go. Still, I'm about to go serve it in Applebee's, instead of dealing with these slimy sacks of Stefano. Most of the servers have exchanged contact information in case anyone does decide to bring this to the labor board. An entire process I'm unfamiliar with. I'm used to business owners always getting away with it. We get paid on the 20th, and if my shift don't look right, I'm gonna lose it and put the fear of God into them. It's 4am, and I got a double starting at 11, and I'm laying here with my blood boiling. Honestly, thinking about not even going and demanding a check up front again. 4. This happened several years ago. I'm a 31-year-old woman, and it was during my tenure as a server at a restaurant in a decently touristy area. I have an entire smorgasbord of wild stories, local politicians getting huffy at not getting special treatment, 90-year-old men threatening to spank me, two lawyer parents arguing why their 16-year-old daughter should be allowed to drink as though it were a courtroom, etc. Along with your average restaurant, no one matured past high school work environment. Without getting too specific about where I was, the restaurant was somewhat dog-themed. In the name, and like two of the decorations, but outside of that, 
it was largely just a pub-style restaurant. But with our name, most folks expected us to be a dog-friendly establishment. Unfortunately, shortly before I started working there, the health department had begun to crack down on restaurants in the area allowing dogs in, which was against the health code. As such, in an effort to live up to our name, management chucked off an arm and a leg to get permission to have a dog-friendly section on the patio. Part of the permission came with several rules, like dogs can't sit in chairs or on tables, or dogs must be on a leash or in carriage, or dogs must have separate entrance and exit, stuff like that. If you sit down and think about it, it makes sense for protecting people who may have an allergy or phobia or any other reason to avoid a dog in public. The following happened shortly before my 20th birthday. In the middle of summer, it was cloudy, it was humid, bugs were flying, and absolutely no one wanted to sit on the patio. I was a hostess that day, and I felt bad for my patio server who wasn't getting any business. Until lo, a middle-aged woman appears. An unentitled woman. Hi, my husband and I have a dog, and we were hoping to sit out on the patio. Great, just give me a second and I'll get you set up in the dog-friendly section. I collect their menus and lead them outside to find her husband, who I will lovingly refer to as Entitled Chair Guy. Along with a cute, elderly beagle, already sitting in the dog-free section. For the record, all the patio tables had little signs on them denoting them as dog-friendly, or dog-free, to make it easy on people. So had this guy been using his eyes, he could have easily solved our first encounter before it began. Me and my chippiest customer service voice. Hi sir, just so you know, you're in the dog-free section right now, but if you move over just one table, you'll be in the dog-friendly section and we can get you started. He looks up from his phone and his dark beady eyes met mine and he says, are you serious? Now I'm a bit taken back at the hostility at such a basic request, but I'm no novice at bad customers. I repeat the rules and explain it's due to the restaurant needing to follow the health code. He continues to protest. His wife jumps in and starts pleading that it's just one table, why don't you just move? And now I feel even worse for her. Finally, he throws his hands up in the air and shouts, Fine, but if my dog gets hit by a car, are you the one I sue? Context. The dog-friendly section was adjacent to the sidewalk, which was adjacent to the road. So if you're going to be hit by a car, it was technically the most likely spot. It also had never happened in the restaurant's multi-decade lifespan. At this point, my irritation meter is firmly in the red, as I realize he's one of those entitled people. The ones who spit and threaten when they don't get their way. I shouldn't even smile and say, That's probably a question for my manager. <laughs> or your attorney. He really thinks he got me with that zinger as I'm setting him down in the dog friendly section. But really I'm just hiding laughs, because these are the most pathetic kinds of people we serve. I just warn his server he's a douche and go on with my day. I later bring out a bowl of water for the dog, because it's hot and gross and the poor thing shouldn't be dehydrated. You know, it was standard practice for us to bring dogs water while their owners ate. I set it down and immediately, is that tap water or bottled water? I fight the urge to deadpan, it's tap water sir, would you like me to go out and buy bottled water? At that point the dog begins drinking, and he slams his hand on the table and shouts, well it's too late now. Let's better hope it's not poisoned. Now the guy has me wondering if his dog is up to date on its shots or if he's an anti-vaxxer. His server told me later he poured out the water. I have no clue if she was referring to his water or the dog's water, but he loudly complained there were bugs in it. I'd like to remind you, dear listener, that it was a disgusting, humid, muggy summer day, and this man decided to eat outside. While I do understand the initial revulsion at seeing a bug in your meal or drink, he was in the bug's world, dear listener, not ours, and we had no control over that. We still replaced his water, though. About 20 minutes later, his entree is ordered. He and his wife are eating an appetizer. The dog is chilling. And some other mad soul walks inside and asks to sit on the patio. Just to be petty, I put him in the chair that our entitled chair guy had originally commandeered. 
but then I look over. Entitled Chair Guy had his beagle in his lap while he was eating his food. If you remember from about ten years ago when I was explaining some of the mandates we got from the health department, one of them was, dogs can't sit in chairs or on tables. And while some of you might contest it, the dog being in his lap constituted being in a chair, in the health department's eyes. Now, I didn't want to deal with this, but I knew that between me and his server, on the one in a million chance that a health official just happened to walk by and see us breaking the rules, one of us would get thrown under the bus. So as unentitled wife goes inside to order a drink from the bar, I slap on my customer service voice and stroll over to their table. Hi, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I need to tell you that it's unfortunately against the health code for your dog to be in the chair with you. He goes silent for a few moments, simmering until, show me the health code, excuse me. I'm not doing anything unless you show me the health code. At this point, my patience is wafer thin. This man is finding ways to push all the most annoying buttons rather than just following a basic rule and letting us all get on with our days. Rather than continue with him and risk losing my temper, I go back inside and cool down and find a manager. I find one, we go to the office, and she prints out the list of rules emailed to us by the health department. Then she holds up the paper to me and says, Now this can go one of two ways. I can take this down to him, and you never have to see him again, or you can take this down to him and get that smug, satisfied feeling of telling him you were right. This is where I may have erred, dear listener. You see, I really didn't want to see him again. His beady black eyes, his thin, greased black hair, his rubbery white skin. The man looked like death himself. Stoking that fire to sate my ego could go terribly wrong. <laughs> But I really, really wanted that smug, satisfied feeling of telling him I was right. What can I say? I wasn't even twenty. Mustering my courage, I take the paper, and as I walk back outside, I internally hype myself up, until I'm strutting over to his table. I hand him the paper. Hi, sir, here is the health code, as you requested. As you can see here, it says we cannot allow dogs to sit in the chairs, or we get a massive fine. He takes the paper and peers down at the rule carefully then analyzes the whole paper as if looking for a loophole. But he must not have found one, because instead, he throws the paper on the ground, I threw it on the ground, and tells me where I can shove it. It wasn't in the bin. This man finally gave me a reason to drop the customer service voice, which, for the record, is very light and high-pitched. My normal talking voice is surprisingly deep and not as cheery, so I glare down, drop my register and growl. Sir. Put the dog on the ground or leave. This startled him at first, but he, being a man, a manly man, doing what he can, doing many things across this land, a man, with an attorney and me being a short little waitress working for pennies after all, regathers himself quickly. He scoops up his dog in his arm, stands and then takes his heavy metal chair and flings it behind him. It goes under our railing and nearly strikes two random women walking by. And then, dear listener, the piece de resistance. He sits down, on the ground, with his dog in his lap. Now at this point, I have seen a lot in my service industry career. I can handle someone throwing a temper tantrum, I can't handle someone throwing a chair. Luckily, the two women he'd very nearly assaulted knew exactly what to do. They leer over him from behind the railing and began screaming. Gone full Karen for justice on this guy's behind. The more they screamed, the more he shrank, and we'd attracted a small crowd of attention. Then they turned their gaze on me. Oh my gosh, sweetie, are you okay? You know, we're from Brooklyn, and even we find this appalling. Suddenly, I snapped back to reality and realized I'd been rescued. What? Huh. I laugh and rejoin the conversation with the women, with the pouting man between us. I not so subtly bemoan the immaturity and entitledness I saw on a daily basis. Overall, they were very sweet. Finally, entitled chairless guy's server comes out. His unentitled wife in tow. She'd been inside this whole time completely unaware of her husband's outburst. She looks utterly horrified and ashamed. Their server lets me know the management is on their way immediately. We file inside, and all the employees crowd around a nearby window to watch as our manager goes out. 
Entitled Chairless Guy keeps sticking his finger in her face, speaking through gritty teeth, <laughs> looking like he's about to pop a vessel. All the while, his hopefully soon-to-be unentitled ex-wife is mortified, and our manager is bored. Finally, they leave. My manager comes back inside and tells us, Okay. He said he'd see me next Tuesday and told me to go screw myself. And if he ever comes back, we're calling the police. Hellfreezer's note. Now, admittedly, I'm not a server, so I understand it probably wouldn't be permissible. Unless you have a really awesome manager who's told you ahead of time you can do it. But if someone's threatening lawyers as soon as they come into the place, would it not be nice just to look at them and say, I'm very sorry to hear you won't be dining with us today, sir. And then walk away. And I understand... Probably not possible, but it would be ever so nice. Five. I had a two-top yesterday, and the interaction with them absolutely blew me away. For context, I work at your traditional northeastern U.S. diner. It's my second week being back after a few months of working elsewhere, and I'm still learning the menu. Guy number one is wearing a bicycle helmet, as the two had just got back from a trip at a nearby trail. Why something with beans, like a bean burrito? Can I get a bean burrito? We don't serve bean burritos or burritos in general. The closest thing we have to burritos are wraps, though. Oh, well. What do you like to eat here? Honestly, I've only ever had breakfast and burgers from here. They're both pretty good. He flips around to the burger section of the menu. Gentleman number two leans into number one and whispers something I can't hear, to which number one says... Yeah, they'll probably think I'm mentally ill, before taking off his helmet. Do you have any burgers with... vegan cheese? We don't serve vegan cheese here. We only have select gluten-free options, like toast and pasta. What about a burger with beans, or like a bean burger? We don't have bean burgers here. Oh. Do you have any burgers with guacamole on them? Not with guacamole, but avocado. I could always get you a side of guacamole with your meal, though. Is your guacamole dairy-free? Last time I came, the guacamole had sour cream in it. At this moment, I'm just about blown away. Keep in mind, I still haven't even got their drinks yet. I'm confused. That happened here? Really? Yeah. I'm pretty sure our guacamole doesn't have sour cream in it, but I could ask the cooks just to make sure. Yeah, could you? I grabbed their drinks and the soup number one ordered, and assured him there's no sour cream in the guacamole. Number one is delighted, and orders a bison burger with guacamole and a baked potato. I then leave to bring over the soup number one previously ordered. He immediately says, I have a lot of stuff going on in my life. What are some good coping mechanisms? Uh, I like to play a lot of video games, that's just my thing. Some games help, says Guy too. The small talk kind of ends. Sometime later, I bring over their entrees. Here you are, fellas. My friend here gave me some pretty good advice. Yeah, what's that? He said I need to be more self-reliant and trust myself to make good decisions. That sounds like some great advice. Trusting your gut always helps. At this moment, number one is eyeing down his guacamole. Are you sure this doesn't have sour cream in it? It's pretty light. I did ask the cooks previously, but if you want, I could double check. Yeah, could you double check for me? I go back and ask a different cook, same answer I come back and tell him nothing has changed. He seems okay. The rest of the meal they eat with no problems. Number one seemed to love the guacamole, as I had to get him two more sides. Turns out, number one knows my mom and I for my first diner job. It was about three years ago, and I've seen way too many faces to remember. He was a nice kid. Hopefully he comes in again, because I love when my shift sometimes turns into an episode of The Twilight Zone. Thank you for whoever took the time to listen. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Spinning Plates, episode 243. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button and share the video around. 
If you'd like early access to these videos, you can get them on a Monday by supporting me on my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. You'll also find links in the description to the Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring. There's also a Hellfreezer Discord link there. And if you really enjoy today's video, then you can leave a tip by clicking on the heart with the dollar sign underneath. But that is not and is never required, although I do appreciate it. Okay, no other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is, what is the most unusual topping that you personally like to put on a burger? Now, I'm not sure how unusual this is, but it's just something I like to do. I like to put, like, egg mayonnaise on burgers as a topping. Sometimes I'll put it on there with cheese, sometimes in, in lieu of cheese, but it's just very, very yummy, and it goes quite well with any kind of burger I've found. It goes quite well with bean burgers, as it happens, and I quite enjoy it. So why don't you let me know what your toppings are so I can steal them and try them myself in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And I believe this was in relation to the, the, the nights being lighter. Like, do you prefer the lighter nights or the darker nights? And how my opinion has kind of changed over the years. And today's answer comes from 22 Roses Grow. And their answer is, there's a balance, as all things should be. I like early mornings after coffee to get the brain braining. Night owl hours are good, too. Long, dark nights are cool if there's a bonfire or campfire. Simply enough stars in the sky. Life is short. Enjoy those stars. And thank you very much for your answer, Roses Grow. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening. And take very good care of yourself.